I want to begin with, you know, kind of acknowledging, you know, much in the same way that Paul's song did, that, um, you know, we are definitely early entrants in the field of autism research. So um, we are learning a whole lot, and um, I very much enjoy this conference. Uh, we are a company that's based in Boulder, Colorado, um, that is focusing entirely on novel mechanism of action antibacterial drugs. Uh, we have been doing this for quite some time. The key focus is, of course, infectious diseases control and, and resistant bacteria. And we have managed to advance our program since our founding in 2009 uh, with support mostly from the NIH and mostly from NIAID. And so consequently, we're still uh, owned by um, the founders, employees, and, and advisors. Um, um, so I too am going to begin with C. diff. And, and um, what Mark has provided is a wonderful segue into what we, uh, what we are planning on doing. Uh, so you've heard about C. diff. It's um, an infection caused by a pathogen that is um, sport forming and is responsible for quite a few cases and, and deaths in the US. Uh, the CDC still has it as a threat level, urgent level. And it's increasingly seen in the community. Now, one thing that is important to understand about C. diff is that because it can form spores, uh, much like many other Clostridia, it really is everywhere. So uh, it's really not feasible to uh, prevent us from being exposed to it. Uh, and the only thing that protects us is our normal healthy flora, which suppresses the C. diff. But if this is disrupted with broad spectrum antibiotics, chemotherapy, or uh, immunosuppression, C. diff can, can expand. And it, because it produces these toxins that are uh, heavily damaging to the gut um, epithelium, uh, it can rapidly become a serious clinical problem. These spores are extraordinarily hard to eradicate. They are resistant to ethanol wipes. In fact, that's how you get the spores to form. And if you look at this image on the right, which I always found amusing, this is supposed to be a glove uh, that's supposedly sterile um, from a patient um, or after contact with a patient who took a shower one hour before. So. Uh, these things are absolutely everywhere. And so um, um, Mark also mentioned that vancomycin is used quite a bit for um, C. diff infection or CDI. Uh, there's a lot of concern about this. One is uh, the, the resistance to vancomycin against enterococci or vancomycin resistant enterococci, VRE, uh, which can cause serious systemic infections. And it turns out that more than half of C. diff patients have concurrent VRE colonization. And the biggest problem is that it's still heavily disruptive of normal gut micro, microbiota, which drives a high incidence of recurrence. So, you know, what led people to be susceptible to C. diff, which is exposure to a super broad spectrum antibiotic like augmentin, they they take C. diff, which suppress, they take vancomycin, which suppresses C. diff, but then they get recurrence because they haven't really had a chance to regenerate their flora. Uh, it was an effort to spare vancomycin use that led to use to uh, of an even worse uh, treatment option, uh, which is metronidazole. And this was promoted by the CDC in an effort to actually spare vancomycin. And there's now quite a bit of recognition in the field that you want narrow spectrum drugs to treat C. diff so that the disruption of flora is minimized. Um, and there are some newer drugs like fidaxomycin that uh, are quite a bit narrower spectrum. So, what we are developing as a new treatment for C. diff 
is a novel mechanism of, of action drug candidate called CRS3123, uh, which inhibits one of the enzymes that is essential for protein synthesis in bacteria called methanyl tRNA synthetase. Uh, this is an essential gene and it's involved in both initiation of protein synthesis because every protein in bacteria begins with methionine as well as for elongation. A and bacterial enzymes are quite a bit different from eukaryotic enzymes. So, you know, there's really no concern um, about, um, about really cross reactivity with the human enzyme. Uh, we have done quite a bit of work to understand the mechanism of action of this drug. And we know that it interferes with the first step in this enzymatic process where the substrates are methionine and a ATP, uh, uh, which uh, the enzyme converts to this high energy methionyl adenylate in intermediate, which is then loaded onto the tRNA. And this is a nice small molecule, which has one chiral center that we worked uh, to optimize for activity against C. diff. Um, we also know that the, this drug candidate binds at the active site of the enzyme. Uh, the drug here is shown in yellow for carbons, and it binds in the pocket that is occupied by methionine. So it's a competitor inhibitor, a competitive inhibitor of methionine, but it can bind at the same time with ATP. And this is really important because there's a lot of ATP in the cell. So the presence of ATP actually only increases the activity of our drug. Uh, the spectrum uh, that we are seeing, which is quite narrow, is a consequence of the existence of multiple forms of methanyl tRNA synthetase or MetRS. The type one enzyme, which is found in uh, many of the aerobic gram-positive bacteria uh, is susceptible. The same enzyme is found in C. diff and other clostridia, as I will show you uh, in just a little bit. Uh, the type 2 enzyme, which is found in most intestinal anaerobes, as well as almost all gram-negative bacteria, um, is completely resistant to treatment of this kind of uh, uh, the drug. So the narrow spectrum is explained by the phylogeny of this enzyme, of, of the target. Uh, what we have shown is that many of the species, because of this, uh, that constitute normal flora, such as actinomyces, bacteroides, bifidobacteria, lactobacilla, Prevotella and so on, uh, re really are, are, are not affected by our drug. Whereas if you, if you look at the two other drugs that are used for C. diff therapy, vancomycin and metronidazole, they, they hit various species uh, to varying extents, which is why recurrence is such a big problem. Now, when we turn our attention to Clostridia, C. diff, of course, is susceptible because we optimize the drug to target C. diff. But we also are seeing quite good activity against C. perfringens, C. boltiae, um, but much less activity against some of the beneficial uh, clostridia, such as Clostridium ramosum. Now, I do want to say at this point that the reason that we are uh, going in this direction now has actually to do with Ellen Bolte, uh, who was a co-author on this Sandler study that Mark nicely reviewed. Uh, it was Ellen who really sought Sid Feingold uh, because her child has autism. And it was Sid who contacted us and asked us a number of years ago if we were interested in considering our uh, CRS3123 for autism. We, I have to admit, did not take this seriously at first. Uh, we didn't have any clinical data to begin with. So we had to say it's too early. We really can't do anything about it. But the activity, I'm just drawing your uh, attention to the fact, and I've spoken with John 
about this. You know, there is a reason, you know, there's a connection between, uh, between Ellen, this organism, Clostridium voltiae, and our engagement in this study. And I'm hoping that John will tell a nice story someday about all of this, uh, should this work. Um, we have now uh, been fortunate to have gotten uh, considerable support from NIAD, with whom we have uh, completed two phase one studies. Uh, the first one was single ascending dose. We went up to doses of 1.2 grams. And then, because this all looked pretty good, moved to the multiple ascending dose study where we tested three different doses, 200, 400, 600 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. And again, saw a very good um, safety and tolerability uh, profile, as well as with limited impact on the gut the microbiome, which is what we were ho hoping for. So here's what we have seen. Uh, this is summarized on the right-hand side of the slide at the very high level where we have done a lot of lumping of bacteria into these phyla. And so, for example, this light blue is uh, Firmicutes, um, purple is Bacteroidetes, uh, which is, you know, which are the main uh, constituents of the normal flora. So you can see that in the placebo group, uh, and these are treatment days uh, zero through nine, um, that, you know, there's not much change among the placebo subjects throughout this observation period. At the lowest dose, we see something that's really not all that different from placebo, although you see some changes in some of the phyla. And then at 400 and 600 milligram BID doses, especially, you do see uh, more changes, but they tend to be uh, transient in that there is a reversion after you stop treatment. I do want to point out that you know, there's this trend toward an increase in bacteroides at the higher doses. And we've all seen that uh, Bacteroides fragilis, which is by far the, the largest constituent among the Bacteroides, uh, can actually be beneficial in alleviating autism symptoms. So if there is a trend toward change, it might well be a good one. Uh, what we have also seen is that most of this drug stays in the gut. Uh, we expected this based on preclinical studies uh, but it, for sure, it was nice to see this in um, healthy volunteers as well. And so uh, these are the levels of the drug at the three different doses that we uh, tested. Uh, what is reassuring to see is that the levels of the drug expressed in micrograms per gram of stool are uh, orders of magnitude above the MIC, which is on the floor of this uh, diagram, with an MIC of one, but it's also above what's known as the mutant prevention concentration, uh, which is the concentration above which you are actually preventing uh, uh, resistant mutations from taking place. So we feel that this is a really positive um, observation. And based on this slide, as well as the previous slide, we decided to go into phase two uh, with 200 and 400 milligram doses. Um, so um, our phase two is about to begin. Uh, we have gotten another support from uh, NIAD, which has been incredibly generous, which we received at, uh, uh, at the end of last year. And we're about to uh, begin enrolling patients. Um, we have our study may proceed the letter from the FDA. Uh, we're gonna look at three different groups 200, 400 milligrams PID, and then we'll compare that with standard of care vancomycin. Uh, treatment for 10 days, this will be a double blind study. We'll need approximately 30 sites to complete the study in about a year or two year and a half. And the primary endpoints are standard, which is clinical cure rate, time to resolution of the symptoms, as well as recurrence rate, which is really the most important thing, and the global cure rate, which is long-term effect. Um, and we'll look at the effect of the gut microbiota now in patients. 
and we'll look at a few other things such as toxin and monitor drug exposure in plasma uh, and stool. So uh, this is our target product profile. I've mentioned most of these things. Uh, we want to take advantage of our narrow spectrum. Uh, we do know that we are rapidly stopping toxin production in C. diff. This is not surprising because our drug is a protein synthesis inhibitor and these toxins are proteins. And so this may translate to other pathogenic clostridia, which I will get to in just a moment. We're also seeing inhibition of spore formation, which may reduce recurrence transmission as well as dissemination. And because we have a novel mechanism of action drug, we're not going to be compromising the effectiveness of other antibiotics. Um, we have just received from the FDA what's known as the Qualified Infectious Diseases Product, as well as a fast track designation. So uh, we feel pretty good about that. Uh, the drug is a nice small molecule. Uh, we know we can make it at large quantities. Uh, we have developed uh, what the chemists would call the nice convergent synthesis. And so we, we have enough drug to support our autism studies from the same batch that we are using for our C. diff study. So now uh, on to autism. I know this was kind of a long-winded introduction to where we're going, but I thought it was relevant to put, you know, what we would like to do in autism in the context with what we are already doing in C. diff. So while we are, we are, you know, we're just beginning uh, to enter this field, uh, we are essentially at phase two in another indication. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about anything on this slide. You guys know this much better than I do. Um, so, and, you know, what I do want to talk about, which is Mark began to, uh, to uh, discuss, is that GI symptoms are frequent in autistic kids. Constipation vary uh, in, in alternating episodes. Uh, there's a connection between GI symptoms and severity, as uh, Jim Adams and Rosie McCrimo McBrown mentioned. Uh, and uh, the gut microbiome is significantly less diverse in, in autistic kids, and, as well as the GI motility and this um, phenotype called a leaky gut. Uh, you know, I put together a number of references, but this is just, you know, this rap sheet is now pretty long. So there's really no um, you know, question that there is a connection uh, here. Um, the way we became interested here is kind of the same way that, that the Sandler study that Mark mentioned you know, really dealt with this. Uh, this, uh, uh, um, this late onset regressive autism, which are occurs in quite a few cases, whether this is a third or another number is almost not all that important. But the idea is that a child will be developing normally, then they take a course of a broad spectrum antibiotic, typically for an ear infection, then they get diarrhea, and then they, they regress into some, some form of autistic uh, behavior. So it was this that led Ellen Bolte to really kind of explore this in more detail. Um, and um, it was shown in the Sandler study that some antibiotics like oral vancomycin can transiently alleviate the symptoms. So the dysbiosis in autism uh, isn't random, but it shows some directional trends. There is a tendency for increased clostridia especially in clusters one, two, and 11, uh, but not others such as 14A and B, which are considered beneficial. Uh, there's also an increase in lactobacilli, at least in some of the patients, and a reduction in bifidobacteria and bacteroides. Uh, now, please recall that, you know, we, we don't have, you know, much activity against these last two phyla. So, um, again, uh, most gut, gut clostridia form, form spores. 
And uh, when there is an opportunity presented by disruption of normal flora, uh, they can become expanded and they are known to be able to produce enterotoxins, neurotoxins, as well as toxin, toxic metabolites. Uh, we've heard about paracresol as well as other metabolites that are now known to be associated with ASD. Uh, I, I did want to bring an anecdote from the C. diff field that at least some of you may find interesting, which is there's this kind of belief that nurses can smell C. diff on, on patients. Uh, they walk in a room, they kind of pick up this barnyard odor, and they say this person has C. diff. Of course, that needs to be coupled with GI symptoms, uh, but that's pretty amazing. And what, what is now well known is this is paracresol, what they're sm smelling. This isn't a diagnostic test, but it would at least triage patients who might have C. diff to then get a real C. diff test and, and for their diagnosis to be confirmed. Um, what we do know is that uh, at least in some autistic uh, kids, there is a substantial elevation in C perfringens, um, uh, which uh, is known to, to be able to produce a large number of uh, toxins. It's, it's also a well-known human as well as animal pathogen. Um, so, uh, and it's a rapid grower and a prolific producer of toxins. Uh, it, it's responsible for a lot of food poisonings, especially from meat sources. And it's also uh, a cause of what's known as gas gangrene, uh, which actually killed a lot of um, soldiers during World War I before there were antibiotics. Now, uh, what, what's also interesting is that C. perfringens is a known toxin in some, um, in some uh, farm species like sheep. Um, um, so, uh, for example, sheep, sheep develop what's known as overeating disease, uh, where you know, and especially the younger sheep will overeat on hay. That causes a, a stalling of the normal peristalsis in the gut, which allows seed perfringens to grow in the localized spots. Then it pokes holes in the intestinal epithelium, and the toxin is released in circulation and ends up binding to receptors in the brain and causing neurotoxicity. Now, what I'm not saying is this exact thing is happening in people, but there is a connection that's well established in sheep that is absolutely due to sheep perfringence. Now, um, you know, we've heard about this Sandler study. I'm not going to review this in any more detail uh, but, you know, uh, the effect was quite pronounced, but it was a transient. What we found exciting uh, when we saw this for the first time is the study that came out of Arizona State University, led by Jim Adams and Rosie Kramerly brown uh, where, you know, they have uh, used vancomycin at the initial phase of the treatment, followed by basically a gastric cleanse, and then reconstitution uh, with a microbiota transplant. And what they've seen is a reduction in both GI symptoms and an improvement in autistic uh, scores. And this uh, the latest uh, paper that came out from the group has shown that this may be the most exciting thing that, that I've seen in some time, but this effect persisted for two years after the treatment. So, um, we, we are proposing that we use CR123 to at least test this hypothesis that we can selectively inhibit pathogenic clostridia um, and spare much of the rest of the normal gut flora. Uh, we are expecting rapid attenuation of toxin production in all clostridia. Um, we expect to inhibit sporulation and spare spare the the, the 
uh, beneficial species such as uh, bacteroides, bifidobacteria, and actinomycin. Uh, we do know that we're going to get uh, high exposure in the gut and limited systemic exposure based on our C. diff clinical studies. So um, it's a little bit too early for us to talk about our phase 1B slash 2A study, but we are definitely doing it with Jim Adams and Rosie Cryer and Brown. Uh, we are very much looking forward to this collaboration. And at a very high level, uh, you know, we are planning on doing a placebo controlled double blinding study. We're well aware of the um, tendency to get a placebo effect in this field. Uh, the first study is likely to be in adolescents, um, really for the same reason as many of the other sponsors are going in this direction. We, we only have safety data in adults. Um, so we're thinking about beginning there, but we are well aware of the fact that it's really in the pediatric population where we may see uh, the biggest effect. So. Uh, in a perfect world, we might do this concurrently in, in adolescents as well as kids, having done all the requisite studies that will allow us to go into pediatric population. But, but this is where we are at this point. We are thinking about beginning at the lowest dose, 200 milligrams PID. Um, and uh, I, I, we agree that it would be important to assess both short term as well as uh, really the duration of effect. And for sure, we're going to assess the effect on the microbiome uh, with the idea that we may also enroll patients on the basis of their microbiological profile on study entry. Um, we are pretty well funded for our two lead programs from NIAD. In fact, uh, NIAD, as I mentioned, has been incredibly generous. Um, and we are looking for a way to fund the actual autism study uh, with CRS one, two, three at this point. And I hope to be able to say more about that uh, the next time we present anything. So in summary, uh, you all know that autism presents uh, uh, a, a substantial unmet medical need. Uh, the gut brain connection is clearly established with this biosis exhibiting clear trend, and we think that Clostridia uh, could be at least one of the offending organisms. Now, I do want to say that, um, you know, because we have an, an antibiotic that is narrow spectrum, and yet it does have activity against more than just the Clostridia, uh, you know, we may see effects that, you know, where the mechanism of action as far as rebalancing the microbiome may actually be broader than just this, but at least this is our hypothesis at, at this time. The vancomycin uh, treatment and really treatment with other antibiotics uh, for which there is a huge number of anecdotal reports, which uh, John Brodakis knows, knows quite well, uh, serves as a proof of concept that antibacterial therapy can work, uh, at least in a subset of, of patients. And we do feel that narrow spectrum uh, drug that stays in the gut uh, may have some considerable advantages. Uh, so uh, CRS3123 may well have the right spectrum uh, to at least um, warrant a testing in a pilot study. Um, I want to thank um, Jim Adams and Rosie McCrimley Brown more than anyone because they they have really stepped in and helped us think about this in a way that is quite detailed and uh, our first study uh, we hope will be actually run at ASU um, so uh, we feel fortunate to have collaborators who are committed to this field I want to thank my colleagues in Crestown who have helped with this program, uh, mainly Ur Soxner, who is a microbiologist, John Bruce, who has, who is an MD, who has remarkably enough done a phase 
two clinical trial in autism before. Uh, Don Morrissey, who will help us uh, find uh, resources to do this study. Matt Gingrich, who will help with organization of the study, and Aline, who is uh, our regulatory person. I, I do also want to thank John Rodakis, uh, who has um, been generous with his time and helped us really kind of uh, sort through some difficult questions about how we can get this done, as well as what kind of study we may want to do. And then Richard Fry and Ron Melmed, whom I've reached out to in the very early days, who have helped me really, intro they, they've helped introduce me to Jim Adams. And so, uh, and um, pointed us in the right direction. And, and I do, uh, in the end, want to take, thank Sid Feingold for being persistent with this idea with us, uh, who has since passed away. Um, but we hope to actually do what he um, thought that we should be doing some time ago. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Nabojsha. That was that was really wonderful. Um, it's it's a, it's exciting project. Uh, I also you know very much share with you the the view that we we stand on Sid's and Ellen's shoulders. Uh, you know, it's my hope. Any, anybody who's in the autism and microbiome field, which is a lot of us at this conference, um, you know, I don't think we'd be here if it wasn't for Ellen Volte. And I hope someday the world really understands, you know, her genius and, and how much she has moved moved the, the ball forward. I mean, we would have gotten there eventually, but I think Ellen put us decades ahead. It's, it's just a remarkable story. There was um, one question here on, uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to guess this comes from a from an autism parent because it says, "What is the selection criteria for the ASD study, uh, and do you anticipate testing for dysbiosis? You know, with respect to Clostridia, um, I, I'm not. It's not clear whether they mean as an inclusion criteria or just uh, or, or just in general. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I have felt was. Uh, a, a, an incredibly a careful component of the study for the Sandler study is they enrolled patients who actually fit certain criteria that allowed them to answer a, a well-defined question. Then they enrolled kids who had had this sequence of antibiotic treatment, diarrhea, regressive autism. What we are planning on doing with the first study with Jim and, and, and Rosie is to enroll patients most likely on the basis of elevated levels of clostridium. I want to leave this as a general concept because we are still working out some key details, but that is where our head is at this point. Now, um, and so then that may be the first study that we do. Now, there is a case to be made that we are completely aware of that says, no, 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 no. Just kind of enroll people who have GI symptoms, regardless of what, you know, causative agents are and see what your drug does. Um, I do understand that argument. I, you know, and, and I think that we may expand the study at some point to ask that question uh, because the effect of our drug, as I mentioned, we do understand the target, we understand the mechanism of action, we understand the spectrum, but the bacterial community in the gut is just that. It's a community where there's all kinds of interactions among all kinds of species. How we affect that is really not something that we understand in any great level of detail. And we, you know, we want to have enough humility to recognize the complexity of, 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 of that fact and just ask a question perhaps at some point in a very broad, broad way and see what results we may get.